Well, hello and good morning. It's me, Kenny Polkari, and today is Tuesday, February 20th, 2024. And here are the things you need to know uh, to get your day started and your week started. So on Friday, the PPI came in hotter than even what the CPI was earlier in, in the week. Treasury prices continue to decline, sending yields up and up and stocks going down. Oil's testing a bit higher. The hoodies continue to cause chaos in the Red Sea. Gold is trying to stabilize. Walmart and Home Depot both beat, but are trading lower on their initial uh, reaction. NVIDIA is due out tomorrow. Now, what are we having for dinner tonight? We're going to have the pan-roasted chicken in a Dijon white wine sauce. Okay, so somebody just hit the pause button on Friday, right? And stocks fell. All as investors, traders, and algos digested all of the week's data. And then on Friday, the data hit investors upside the head and didn't help the narrative of lower rates. The all-important producer price index, uh, inflation at the producer level, rose more than expected and more than the CPI did on Tuesday. In addition, uh, it was Friday going into a long weekend, right? So the end of the day weakness wasn't really a surprise uh, as we moved into uh, the four o'clock bell, considering everything else that's going on, both economically as well as geopolitically. By four o'clock uh, on Friday, the Dow lost 145 points or four tenths. The S&P was down 25 points or half a percent. The Nasdaq gave back 130 points or eight tenths of a percent. The Russell uh, small mid caps lost 28 points or 1.4 percent. The transports gave up 278 points or 1.7 percent while the equal weighted S&P lost 30 points or a half a percent. So at 8.30 on Friday, we got the PPI and it was hot, right? Final demand month over month up three tenths versus the expected up one tenth. Final demand year over year rose nine, up nine tenths versus the expected plus six tenths. X food and energy month over month was up uh, half a percent versus uh, the expected one tenth and year over year was up 2% versus the expected 1.6. And all that did was confirm that inflation is not dead and may remain sticky for a while longer, and that means that the Fed is going to be hard-pressed to convince us or the markets that they need to cut rates. And remember, PPI leads to CPI. So higher prices at the PPI level weave their way down through the system to the CPI level over a period of about four to six weeks. So what that says is that the next CPI report due on May 12, March 12th or, and even the one after that, due out on April 10th, will most likely be higher as well. So tell me again, why and how is JJ going to explain the need to lower rates? On the other side, we did get housing starts and they plummeted, falling 14.8% month over month while building permits, which were expected to gain 1.3%, fell by 1.5%. So overall, the data suggests a mixed picture. Right? Remember, housing is directly sensitive to mortgage rates, and those rates have crept higher once again, currently in the seven and a quarter percent range for someone with a 740 FICO score or higher. Home builders fell by about 1.2 percent on the back of that news. Now, bond prices tumbled as well as the ego data only confirms higher for longer. The TLT and the TLH both down a half a percent, leaving these bond ETFs down 6.2 percent and 4.9 percent, uh, respectively. The two-year is now uh, pushing yields at 4.6%. The 10-year is pushing 427 Both still well below the level seen in October when they both pierced 5%. But with the ongoing fight with inflation, the need for Janet uh, to fund the deficit, it's sure to be a challenging environment for stocks in the weeks and months ahead. Remember, as she brings more supply, bond supply to the market, that's going to put pressure on prices, uh, and lower bond prices means higher yields. And if we continue to push lower, then yields will be kissing 5% before you know it, right? And so what did we see? We saw the most interest rate sensitive sectors get punched, right? Think real estate was down 1%. Tech was down 1%. Disruptive tech uh, down 2.5%. The semis were down 6 tenths. Expanded tech down one7 Home builders, like I said, down one2 but we also saw this year's best performing sectors also come under some pressure. Communications, which was up 10% year to date, gave up 1.6% on Friday. Airlines, which was up 6.3% year to date, lost 1.1%. The growth trade, the SPYG, was up 8.5% uh, year to date. They gave back 6 tenths. And then the general weakness in the broader markets are industrials down 6 tenths, financials down 3 tenths, consumer discretionary down uh, 6 tenths, retail down five, uh, half a percent, regional banks, the KRE down 1%. 
And so where did the money move to? Well, some went to cash and some went to healthcare up four tenths. Consumer staples up uh, a, a tenth of a percent. Basic materials up a half a percent. Now remember, n note this, that healthcare was an underperformer last year. It was up 1% last year. It is one of this year's best performers, up 6.8% as of this morning. So far this year, here's how the year is playing out. So you kind of put it in your head. Communications is the leader, up 8.6%. Was a leader last year too. Healthcare up 6.8. Financials up 5.4. The tech up five and a quarter. Industrials up three and a half percent. Energy up two percent. Consumer stables up 1.7. Consumer discretionary up a tenth of a percent. Basic materials down four tenths. Utilities down 3.3 percent, and real estate down 4.3 percent. Eco data today includes the Philly non-manufacturing index. Think services. And remember, we're a services economy, so this is kind of an important indicator. Wednesday, which is tomorrow, we're going to get the January FOMC minutes. Thursday, we're going to get the Chicago Fed activity, uh, initial jobless claims and continuing claims, and both the manufacturing and services PMIs, which are both expected to remain in expansionary territory, right? We're also going to get existing home sales, which are supposed to be up 5%. But remember, last month, they plunged by 14.8%. So a bounce is expected. But remember, mortgage rates are higher than they were three weeks ago. So let's just see what happens. Oil on Friday rallied, closing at 79.20 a barrel. This morning it tested as high as 79.75. It is now trading about 78.80. The latest strength in oil coming from the ongoing disruption created by the Hooties on Friday and then over the weekend when they attacked another commercial vessel in the Red Sea, forcing, by the way, for the first time, an evacuation of that ship. This, along with the ongoing strikes on U.S. assets by the Iranian-backed Houthis, will keep the tensions high and the prospect of a wider conflict in the Mideast alive. Transit via the Suez Canal, right, the Red Sea into the Suez Canal, has come to a near standstill as the risk rises. And while it's not completely closed down, any increase in attacks only raises the risk of a shutdown, and that will further disrupt commercial shipping rates, com uh, you know, commerce and commercial shipping rates as container ships are forced to go around the Cape Horn versus through the canal. So expect the price of oil to remain elevated, right? We have now pierced the January high of 79.30, leaving many oil analysts to suggest the next stop is $85 a barrel, a level last seen in October, and certainly a level that the Saudis would love to see. Gold, which tested $2,000 last week after the hotter than expected CPI, has tried to stabilize and rally back just a bit, right? This morning it's up $13 at $2,037 an ounce as gold traders wait to dissect the FOMC minutes tomorrow. But what are they really going to expect to find out? Are the minutes going to contradict what the Fed heads have all been saying? Doubtful, right? Which is why I think it's a bit toppy here. I think gold now remains in the 2020-50 trading range versus 2050-2100, right? Earnings today include Home Depot. They beat, but they did have some weakness in staying source sales, right? The stock was down 12 points or 3% in the pre-market, right? Of course it is. Did you see what they did going into the report? It's up 7.6% since January, Walmart reports, and they beat as well. E-commerce sales are soaring, right? They reported $1.80 versus $1.65. Better forward guidance. They're raising the dividend by 9% to $0.83 cents a share. They're also buying Vizio TVs for $11.50 a share, right? Friday's close was nine fifty three. dollars It's a 20% premium. I'm still not sure why they're buying Vizio. They said they want to increase ad sales. But Vizio is a TV manufacturer. So we'll find out more about that as the day goes on. And speaking of takeovers, Capital One Financial is buying Discover Card for $35 billion, creating a consumer colossus. Capital One is trading down seven points at $130.50, while Discover Financial is up $15 at $125 a share. Vanguard Capital Group, BlackRock, and State Street are the four biggest holders of DFS. They're also the four biggest holders of Capital One. So they lose $7 on one position, but they're gaining $15 on the, on the other. So net-net, they're up $8 on the whole position. Now, U.S. futures this morning uh, are lower, right? Dow futures down 150, SP's down 16, the Nasdaq's down 84, and the Russell's down 15 points. While the earnings today are all very exciting, it's really going to be tomorrow's NVIDIA report that drives the overall tone of the market, at least for tomorrow and through the end of the week, I think. Now, look, NVIDIA's up 46% this year. That's in seven weeks. It is priced to perfection. 
So in my opinion, the stock can only go down on this report, no matter what they report. Unless, of course, they tell us something that is completely unknown to the markets, right? Now, could they split the stock? Maybe. I mean, it, it's 200 points higher than the last time. And while I expect that they're going to blow the doors in the roof off the house, I also expect that the trader types uh, are going to sell it and large asset managers are going to peel some off of their large positions to lock in some of these astronomical gains, which doesn't mean the game is over. It's just trading and risk management. So don't you know read too much into any weakness that you see in NVIDIA. European markets this morning are slightly higher. Barclays is up 5% as they announce an overhaul and substantial cost-cutting program. Other than that, there's no real economic data to drive the action. Markets across the region are, are flat to up. Uh, Germany is up the most at uh, plus 1.8%. 1, 1 the S&P closed at 5,005 on Friday, down 25 points, which makes complete sense since the latest inflation report does not support the rate cut narrative. And with Treasury yields now pushing multi-year highs and likely going higher still, the pressure will be on equities. But for now, the economy and the markets have shown little signs of stress, which only continues to support that no rate cut narrative, right? Now, let's see if tomorrow's FOMC minutes reveal something that we don't already know. Don't bet on it. I don't think it's going to, but let's just see. In the end, I think we have topped out here on the S&P. I expect it to churn and kind of pull back into the end of the quarter, which is, you know, March 31st. Trendline support is down at 48.13, which is a 4% move from here. No one should be surprised if we test that level. It is well within the normal trading band. And actually, it'll shake the brains a little bit. And let's see who falls out. I, for one, would love to see us back off like that, along with a whole lot of other long-term investors. So what are we going to have for dinner tonight? We're going to have the pan-roasted chicken in a Dijon white wine sauce. Now, for this, you need the chicken parts. So either get a whole chicken and cut it up or just buy the chicken parts. You need olive oil, uh, salt and pepper, white wine, shallots. You've got to mince those. You need fresh rosemary. You've got to chop that. You need a tablespoon of Dijon mustard, right? Start by preheating the oven to 450 degrees so you get it ready for when you need it. Now, you need a heavy-bottomed, oven-proof skillet, right? Uh, you want to heat the oil, put it on high heat until it starts to shimmer. Then turn it down to medium high and then cook the chicken in batches, right? Don't put too much in there because it draws the heat out. You, wanna, you don't want to overcrowd the pan. That's probably about six minutes on each side until the chicken is nice and browned all over. Once every piece has been cooked, put it all back in the pan now and stick the pan in the oven for about 20 minutes at 450 degrees. After that, take it out. Take the chicken out, just set that aside for a minute. Put the skillet back on the stove uh, on medium heat. Now you're gonna add the shallots and some additional rosemary, and you're gonna add the white wine to make the sauce. Let it come to a boil, uh, and then you're gonna whisk in the Dijon mustard, turn the heat down to medium low, let it cook for five to seven minutes. Now you're gonna add the chicken back to the pan, let it heat through. You're gonna spoon the sauce over the chicken uh, just so that it gets all blends together, right? Once, once you're done there, uh, then you can serve this, uh, you know, serve this individually on plates. And I'd serve it with, you know, a green vegetable, something, maybe sautéed spinach or, or, or steamed broccoli or, or sautéed broccolini, something like that, and a large mixed, uh, uh, mixed salad, right? Something with, the, you know, I would go uh, like romaine with red onions and cherry tomatoes and, uh, and some, uh, some scallions and maybe some cucumbers and a lemon uh, olive oil dressing, something simple, salt and pepper, a little bit of oregano, lemon and olive oil, clean, simple, tastes good, doesn't overpower the chicken because the chicken should be the star of this dish in any event. It is an absolutely spectacular day here uh, in Florida. The sky is blue, 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 not a cloud in the sky. I posted this spectacular sunrise picture of a Palm Beach this morning. It's on my Twitter. You should take a look. In any event, I'm on my way to Vegas because I'm speaking at the Money Show tomorrow. So uh, you'll see me broadcasting from there. Until tomorrow, take good care.